Thanks, everyone. Uh, so like LED art is something that I'm pretty passionate about. I first started getting involved doing this about three years or so for various festivals and things of that nature. And so it's something that I just kind of want to talk to you all about today, because I think there's a lot of cool stuff here. Uh, by the way, I have a lot of resources to go along with this talk. You can find it at the URL at the bottom of this slide. And don't worry, this URL will also be on the side of most of the other slides in the presentation. So like LED art is something that I find really fascinating in a lot of ways, because it really is a hybrid of technology, specifically technology that we already tend to know, and art. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions about what art really is. You know, we tend to think of it as this world that's just completely separate from technology. We kind of view them as having no overlap whatsoever. Uh, but I don't think that's true. I think there's actually quite a bit of overlap. Because when we really dig into it, art is quite technical when, when you look at it. We just don't see that or think about it, but it really is. You know, like, for example, have you ever looked at how paints actually work? You know, we often think of painting as one of these sort of classic arts, and we think of it as an artistic medium. When we actually look at how paints work, they are deeply technical. There are all sorts of different types of paints that have different effects, they cure differently, they have different textures, different material properties, there's different ways that you mix them, different ways they age. I mean, there's like science behind paint. There's a lot of technology behind paints. And this is true of most art, uh, that's out there, there's quite a bit of technology, and people who create art are really good at their craft. They're really good at the technology of their arts. But there's still a difference. You know, you know we do classify these as different things for a reason. Uh, and so, like, why is that? So, the question of what is art? How do we define art? That's one of those questions that's sort of puzzled philosophers for pretty much all of human history. And I don't have a uh, claim to have an answer to that question in its entirety. But I do have one small claim to make, just sort of about it at the edges. What I would say about art is that art, we create art by using technology to express emotional truth. And this is what separates art from the typical ways that we use technology and what we think of as technology. Because in the case of uh, technology, or in our case, what we think of technology as, is really we're thinking about products. You know, we're thinking about using technology to create a product usually with the intention of generating profit, or perhaps users that, in theory, according to some very magic Silicon Valley math, generates revenue, which doesn't actually. But you know, we still have this concept of revenue at the end of the day that drives it. And with art, there isn't really that concept. Of our business is a weird thing. We're going to set that aside for the moment. But with art, we're not trying to create revenue. That's not our intention. Our intention is to express some truth about you know, ourselves, about our society, or about the world. You know, it's kind of an inward look in taking it out. And we use technology to express this thing to other people outside for what is inside of ourselves. And so the way we do that, though, is we first got to master our craft. We have to understand the basics of what we do. And so for LED art in specific, like we see this little piece here, uh, there is some technology that goes behind it. And so the first thing I want to talk about, I want to talk about how we can create visualizations that look kind of like this. And we have to start by talking about color and color spaces. And specifically, I want to talk about the HSV color space, which is the hue saturation value. That's what the acronym stands for, color space. Uh, this is very similar to one you might have seen in the web called HSL, or hue saturation luminance. They're actually almost exactly the same thing. There's just a tiny little difference to them. Uh, but this is actually pretty important for understanding color, and especially for doing art with it. Now, to explain why we need that, first let's talk about RGB. So I think we all know what RGB is, red, green, blue. You know, we express colors in the RGB uh, space in terms of how much red is in it, how much green, and how much blue. And these colors sort of add together to create some color. And we use this model because RGB is mechanically how we create color and how we work with color with various visual devices. So for example, with these LEDs, the way we create a color LED, you know, a specific color in here, is there's actually three LEDs embedded in it, one that is red, green, and blue. And we change how bright those various three are to create any color. Same thing with LCD screens, projectors, and basically anything else we can think of that creates a visual device. And in fact, the oldest RGB device is our eyes themselves. So in our eyes, we have three nerves that are light sensitive. And they're specifically sensitive to very, uh, relatively narrow ranges of light, one towards green, 
one towards red and one towards blue. And so RGB is really important in that we use it for color production and color sensing. Like it's a mechanical thing. But it's not how we think about color. Like we look at my pants, I don't look at this and say like, oh, I see equal amounts of red, green, and blue. No, that, that's not what I'm thinking. I see white, right? We just don't think about color in terms of RGB. And so this is where HSV is really, really useful because HSV expresses how we think about color. So to illustrate that, let's talk about it a little bit. Let's talk about hue first. So hue is kind of like the base color in, in a lot of ways. And we measure this in degrees from 0 to 360. There's some mathematical reasons, some graphs, polar coordinates, whatever. We're not going to talk about that. But just know that this represents sort of the spectrum of color. And it actually maps pretty closely to the spectrums of visible light across wavelengths. Like when we use you know, a prism to split up color, the colors that we get there are really similar to the colors we get from the hue here. Same thing when we see a rainbow. So we can start at zero degrees. And at 360 degrees, by the way, it's the same as zero degrees because circle. And we get a red color. But then we go in and we start to shift the hue around a little bit. And we can see the color changes. You know, we've gone up a little bit. Ooh, that's not great. Uh, and so like we get a little bit of a color there, we can shift it further, we get a blue color, we kind of go further, we get a purple, and then eventually we come back around to red. And so this is what hue is. It's sort of like a base color, sort of a primary color in a lot of ways. So the next up we have saturation. And saturation is kind of like basically how washed out is this color. Uh, if you've ever done any sort of image editing using like Photoshop or Lightroom, you'll notice there's a saturation slider. Usually you bump that up to make it more colorful. Well, this is exactly what it's doing under the hood, is it's messing with this part of the color space. And so at 100%, you know, saturation is measured from 0 to 100%. At 100%, this is like full color. This is as much as, much color as you can get. You know, here we have this sort of like fire engine red kind of color. But so we start to drop that down, and we see it getting just a little lighter. It starts to turn into sort of a pinkish. It's, it's not really a vibrant red anymore. It's like lacking vibrancy. And we keep going all the way to zero, and eventually we end up with white. There's a complete lack of color. In fact, taking the saturation to zero on any color will give us white, as it turns out. Now, similar to saturation is then value. And it's sort of, it's actually mathematically related. Again, we're not going to talk about the math too much. But we can think of value as how bright is the color. So again, we have this really bright colored red. But as we start to drop this value from 100% to zero, we see it just getting dimmer. And we're starting to get sort of a, a maroon color at about 50%. And we take it all the way, and then we can get to black. And so these are the three channels that make up hue, saturation, value, uh, color space. So we put it together, we can create anything we want. So let's say we want to create uh, like a lilac sort of color, you know, that light purple. Obviously, I chose purple. My hair is purple. I love purple. So purple, I just happen to remember, is kind of over here. But even if I didn't remember where purple was, you know, there's not that much to go through. You can just sort of mess with the slider, find the color you want. And we know that this is the base color. But this isn't a lilac. Like, a lilac is a fairly washed out color. So now that tells me we need to drop the saturation on it. So we'll take the saturation, and we'll just put it over here. And thus, we have a lilac color. So we've got that. We mess with hue and saturation. But the next thing we can do is we can just make it you know, darker if we want to. We can make it dimmer. Let's say we're having two color themes for a site. We're doing a light and a dark. So the cool thing about the HSV color space is we can take different colors and make them brighter or darker, but they kind of say the same color. Like, we look at this. It's dark colored. But visually, we're like, oh yeah, that's the same thing as this. Like, they're super, super related. And all I'm doing is changing one number. Whereas in RGB, we have to change all three. We don't really know what the relationship is. Like, to get to this color in RGB, I would just have to experiment. Like, I have no idea what this is in RGB. Uh, because we can't reason about RGB. But we can about HSV. And so this is the great thing. Like, HSV color space provides a really great sort of foundation to start doing any sort of color work uh, in art especially, but even in products too, though. HSV is sort of a universally useful color space, I think. But that alone isn't enough to get us an animation. So how do we get to something like that? Well, 
This is where we do a little bit of math. Now, not particularly complicated math. This is like middle school trig level. We're not talking about like advanced calculus or anything. But so we'll do a review because you know, middle school was a long time ago. All right, so it turns out we can do all kinds of animation using sine waves. And this is the full formula for a sine wave. Sometimes we see abbreviated one, but this is actually all of it. There are a couple of parameters. We have a function, you know, f of t, this is sort of our output. We're saying we have some output that is a function of some variable that's an input. For now, we're just gonna keep it abstract, we're gonna call it t, but this could be a distance. You know, it could be, you know, we pass in, say, the value zero for the first LED, one for the next, two for the, you know, and so on and so forth. You know, this is, it's a function argument, just like we have in code. And so then the output is gonna be a, times the sine of omega t plus phi plus b. All right, so what do all of these different variables do? Well, first, let's start with omega. So omega is what's called the angular frequency, which sounds kind of technical, but essentially what that means is like how fast or slow is our sine wave. So right now, we have an omega value of one, but if we go and we mess with it, we start to increase, we can see our sine wave starts to get busier you know, it, it just starts getting faster and faster. So next up we have phi. This is the other part that's inside of the sine wave. And this is essentially an offset. It sort of tells us where does the sine wave start. So you can see we mess with this and we can just see that sine wave sort of sliding around on the screen a bit. Now, in practice, I don't actually use phi myself, but I want to include it for completeness sake. Then next up we have A, which is sort of like a scaling factor for the sine wave. You know, right now this is going from negative one to one. But if we drop this to say 0 0.5, we can see this gets a little thinner. And it's just, it's not as tall of a sine wave. And then last up we have V, and this is sort of a final offset, like a constant offset. And this allows us to shift our sine wave around the, the graph like this. And so with these parameters, we can combine them to create all kinds of stuff. Now there are some interesting things that happen at sort of the edges, sort of the edge cases to this. So for example, I'm gonna scoot this up a bit. Let's say we drop our angular frequency all the way to zero. So when we do that, you know, it's like it's getting slower and slower. Eventually we just get a straight line. And this can be useful if we ever need to do something constant or unchanging. By the way, there's another way that we can achieve this too though. We can also take A you know, that scaling factor of the sine wave and drop it to zero, and we also get a straight line. And so once we have done that, we get the straight line, we can use B to increase or decrease how uh, strong it is. So we, you can think of it as B as like sort of an overall brightness for a constant, and A is an overall brightness for the part that changes. So how does this map to LEDs and color spaces? Well, basically, like this. So in here, we have that exact same formula, Except now instead of f of t, I say color value of x. So what this is saying is we have some color, and we're gonna say that the value, the value channel in HSV, that value, that channel, we're gonna set it based on the sine wave. And it's gonna be a function of x, which is distance, again, is which LED are we talking about here? And so we can see at the bottom, we have kind of what the LED output looks like when we vary the value across distance according to a sine wave. Uh, and by the way, the software that is powering the LEDs on the screen, uh, a lot of it's shared with the software on here, so we're kind of saying the same thing. By the way, WebAssembly is really fun. <laughs> and really hard. So we can go in and we can change the angular frequency according to distance, and if we increase this, we see we start to get these like tiny little waves, like almost just a couple of dots. But then as we spread it out, you know, we can see them getting longer and longer, and eventually we end up with just a flat line. Now there's still a little bit of color here. You might be wondering why that is. Well, so a perfect sine wave, this is essentially like floating point math. You know, these are floating point numbers between negative one and one. But a color space, uh, including HSV, at least the way I did it, you know, we have a value that's between zero and 100%, which under the hood is represented as zero to 255, just like RGB. So we have to map those. So the way I set this up is so that negative one is equal to 0%, and positive one is equal to 100%. So right now we're at basically about 50% brightness, and it's a flat line. 
So we can now use B to make this bright, you know, about as bright as it can get. And then we can also turn it completely off. All right, added some weird thresholding, so ignore that. So it's actually a little bit weird. But nonetheless, we can still do all of this kind of work. We can control how the LEDs work in, across distance, and we can also make it uniform. Now what if we decided to set value as a function of some other variable? Like I mentioned distance is one, but we could do it for something else. So let's take it and make it a function of time. So with time, we get something that looks like this. Uh, we can see I have where the current marker in time is shifting across the graph. Again, positive one is 100%, negative one is zero, and we can see how we just get this lovely fading in and out sort of animation. Uh, again, just it's a sign value. And we can change this uh, just like we did before. We'll increase the angular frequency and we get something that's flashing really fast. And so when I look at something like this, I'm kind of thinking like, this kind of makes me think of an emergency warning light. This is sort of an intense animation. You know, it's a, it's a little bit anxiety producing. It's sort of in your face. So you know, we can use these mathematical parameters to evoke an emotional mood. You know, we can think about light in the way it's used throughout our society. We have these correlations, you know, Fast flashing red like that is, that's a warning sign. So I can evoke a little bit of a mood just by setting a couple of sine wave parameters. Conversely, I can also slow this way down. And so this is like just very slowly changing over time. And if I picked another color, say, uh, then you know, this could be a very calming. It's an almost, almost like it's sort of breathing a, a little bit. So we can evoke a different mood by just changing the rate on this. But anyway, we can uh, affect this and do even more complicated things. We could drop A to say half, and B we can bump up so that's sitting up top like that. And here we go to full brightness with a little bit of clipping. Uh, let me drop that a bit. And then down to like half. So it never gets fully dark, but we can still see it changing and just sort of morphing a little bit over time. Now, what if we made this a function of both time and space? Turns out we can do that with this modification of the formula here. So now, you know, so we've added a little bit more to the sine wave. We have omega t times t plus omega x times x plus phi. So we just added that little bit. We sort of combined the previous two formulas together. And by doing that, we get this roving wave pattern. So with this, you can start to see kind of how this is being assembled in this art piece here. So again, we can slow this down. And you can just, it's just barely moving across. Again, this is a very kind of soothing, slow sort of animation. We can also make it go really fast. So it's just kind of zipping across. Now what's interesting here though is because this doesn't totally go away, we always see some light it's a little bit of a different mood than we had on the previous in which we were flashing it really fast. It's not quite that, you know, warning, warning kind of feeling. To me, this just feels more like energy and movement. So again, by like tweaking this around, we can still get, you know, slightly different uh, emotional feelings out of it. And we can also, you know, so that's changing how fast it is. We can also change this distance and change, again, like, are they little things? And you know, we can shrink this down to this speed. And now it kind of makes me think of like ants marching along or something like that. So you can get some like really fun stuff just by, you know, again, tweaking some mathematical parameters. So, all right, that's how we edit uh, the value channel. And that's kind of what we can do when we're playing with the value. Well, what about the other channels? Well, saturation, again, is very closely related to value in practice. This is sort of an inverse. So here we can see it's fading from red all the way down to white. And same thing, we can make this fade really fast or slow. We can also give it, uh, have it change over distance. And again, we get this sort of like roving wave pattern that we saw before. It's just, you know, a slightly, it's a different way of doing it mathematically and gives a different effect, but we can still do that. And we can also do things like drop that down, bump this up. And so now we have it going from red to pink. It's so, like this could be a great one to do, say, like on Valentine's Day if you happen to celebrate that, because you know we get that like red, pink sort of motif going on. So we can start to get different types of colors and things going on again just by tweaking these parameters. 
All right, so we saw hue, or we saw saturation and value, but what about hue? So hue is different. It, it's less related. We get a different effect. So I wanted to start here. We have everything set to zero, like omega t and omega x. So nothing is changing over time. And we had b set to in the middle. So the way this is mapped, by the way, is zero degrees is negative one, and 360 degrees is positive one. So right now we're sitting at zero, which is right in the middle, it's 180 degrees, which is this light blue color. So we can adjust B, and we'll see it just shifting across the hue. Like we saw before. Again, there's some weird scaling I have with B. Uh, just negative numbers are weird with my algorithm. Uh, but we can kind of just set this to a solid color, just by changing this B value in this equation. So if we want to just set a color, this is how we do it. But then let's start to introduce some variance over time. Let's just increase this to one. And we do that, and now we see it's just starting to slowly cycle through the, all the colors. In and of itself, this can be kind of an interesting animation, because uh, you know, we're, we're just getting this like, changing sort of vibrancy. And we can make it go slow, we can make it go fast. But then we can also introduce uh, uh, some distance over time, or, or we make this a function of x. And this is where I think this gets the most unusual as far as these equations go, because with this, we get this sort of like roving rainbow color. And th this can be a pretty interesting one in and of itself, too, because we're changing the hue over time, so it's like we're going around that circle of hue all the way to the end. And again, we can make that faster or slower. Uh, but what also gets interesting is, let's say we're gonna drop this down to here, and so what this is doing is sort of clamping what part of the circle we're on. So you notice we don't have all the colors anymore. We're not going from red all the way to red. We're just sort of sticking to like kind of right in the middle, or one part of the circle. Uh, this is gonna be, uh, I think, maybe 120 to 108, uh, like 240 degrees, something like that. So we're taking like the slice of colors in the middle, and we can shift this up and down. So if we shift it down, we're gonna mostly see like some warmer colors. All oh, right, again, I have that weird clipping thing. But we get up here to the top and see now we're in like that blue, mostly the blue purple side of the spectrum. So we can sort of clamp into certain ranges of colors and not get all of the colors as well just by tweaking a few more parameters. And so that's how the three color, we can vary the three color channels to create animations uh, using sine waves. However, it turns out, in most cases, there's usually a fourth channel. When we talk about color spaces, we pretty much talk about three channels, RGB, we talk about three, but in practice, we always use four. And the fourth one is alpha, or transparency. You know, we often talk about using the RGBA spectrum, or red, green, blue, alpha. Well, we can do the same thing in the HSV color space, or we can do HSVA, hue, saturation, value, and alpha. And so we can add transparency to these. And so here on this next slide, I'm doing exactly that. In this case, is a black background, so this looks exactly like we saw with value. I can tweak the parameters, and we get the same thing we saw when we were tweaking value. But this is transparent, so it means we can put a layer underneath it. We can start doing layers. We can like composite layers together, and we can bring in multiple waves. So I didn't put all the controls on here, because it would have been a lot, but we have the full controls for the alpha channel on the top layer, and I just have B on the bottom. So we have this roving wave, and again, you know, we can make it faster or slower, we can change the distance. And now I'm gonna bring in the bottom layer, which the bottom layer, by the way, I have a hue of 180 degrees, which again is that teal color. So as we bring this in, we start to see we get a little bit of blue mixed under the red. And so with this, we have, now have two separate colors. We have two completely separate waves doing their own thing, layered in together. And so by the way, the full set of equations running on this looks kind of like that. It's a lot, I know, it's hard to read. I don't like looking at it, so let's look at some code instead. Let's just think about it represented like this. And like this, okay, this is a little more what we're used to. This is a little friendlier looking. Like, I could do this. Uh, so in this case, it's, it's an array of colors. But except instead of setting hue to a constant, we're setting it to a function. We can tweak those parameters. And then we can layer them together. And so when we look at this piece right here, for example, there are actually three layers going on. The very bottom layer is just a solid blue color. It never changes, it's just sitting there being blue. And then on top of that, there's another layer that is set to green. 
But what I'm doing with that is I'm varying the alpha over time. There's nothing with distance. So it's just going from like fully opaque green across the entire strip to fully transparent green. So we get the sort of fading from blue to green. And when you look at it, you can actually kind of see the color in there. But then on top of that, then I have that sort of roving wave pattern we saw in red that makes it look like it's going over. And that's how I created that animation. The system I used to do this, it's a little bit complex. You can talk to me later. But we can do all of this from JavaScript. This is like one of the really cool things about like Johnny Five and NodeBots and that whole world is that we can write some code that looks like this. So we can bring in, there's a library called NodePixel written by AJ Fisher, who I think is sitting over there somewhere. Uh, and then we're taking in Johnny Five, which there's a number of us collaborators here on. And then this library called RVL Node Animations, which I uh, myself wrote, it's kind of some of the stuff running on here. We just sort of mix them together. And most of this code is initialization. You know, it's importing libraries, it's getting the board ready, initializing this strip. But then inside, kind of inside that ready event, that's where we're just gonna go set some colors. We're gonna create a layer. We're using a I created a little helper method, because sometimes I don't wanna use those coefficients directly. So we can like just kind of create an animation, we create a layer. So we composite that into a whole set of wave parameters, which I have a little helper method for. And then finally, we can render from the wave parameters, you know, those sine waves, into a list of RGB pixels. And then finally, we can go and set each pixel in our LED using a node pixel. And so with this code, like this code right here is functional, or at least I think it is, I didn't test it. What can I say? But like this should be functional JavaScript code right here, a few bugs aside. And like that's not very much code to get something like this going. And like this is the thing that I love about JavaScript and why this is so powerful is that once we have this in JavaScript, once we're inside of Node, which is where this is running, that opens up all of the web to us. Specifically, we can do something like this. Now, in this case, the screen that we see here isn't quite synchronous. I think I can do this. So most of this, the slides were synced. This specific page is not. All right, I can't show you. That's OK. But there's a node server running on the Raspberry Pi uh, that I have kind of hidden behind here, which is ultimately controlling this piece right here. And this is its control panel. This is a web app. You know, you could load this up on your mobile phone if you're connected to the right uh, Wi-Fi network. So we can go in here, and we have this one animation. But let's just set it to rainbow. So now we have, we can see a cycling through the hue. And that's also, like, I think, a, a nice animation as well. We can make it go really fast, like, you know, it's just really chugging along. And again, just controlling this from a web application. We can go, there's just like pulsing a color, we get that breathing effect, which I kind of like this one myself. Uh, we can just cycle through colors as well. Like, you know, we have this now in a web application, it's open to the internet. And once we have this, we can like bring people in. You know, we can create art pieces that encourage other people to come and interact with it. Like this is one of the things I think is so exciting about a lot of art coming out these days is that it's interactive. It encourages people to engage with it and explore with it. And I think there's a lot of really profound ways that we can you know, create experiences for people. And so the thing I kind of want to come back to the end is like we're, this is all about doing art. And I really want to encourage all of you to express yourself. Like, art is really, really important. And I, th I personally think that art is the single greatest thing our species has ever created, ever. Like, I think art is what makes us so unique, and I think it represents the best side of us. And so I really encourage all of you to try it out. You know, we have these skills, we have these technology skills, if we just kind of rethink how we're gonna use them, we can start using it to create art. Think about art, and one of the reasons I think it's so important, though, is it's about expressing emotional truth. And to do that, we have to understand ourselves. In order to express what we are feeling through art, we first have to know what we are feeling. And that may sound like a tautology or something simple, but it's actually difficult. It, it takes introspection. Uh, and that's really, really important because it makes us better people. Like, when we know who we really are, when we know how we engage with the world, how we fit in the world, that enables us to then start interacting with the world in a better way. You know, that allows us to be more honest, it allows us to be authentic, to be our true selves. And that's hugely important. It's better for us as individuals, it's better in our relationships, and it allows us to create art. So if there's one thing I wanna leave all of you with today, 
is to think about how can you feed your inner artist and not just feed capitalism. Thank you.